Oh, welcome back to Highlands. Postcards from the finish line here at the Boston Marathon. Stop your cramp, not your race. Also brought to you by Polar, where you chase your destiny. With us, Lisa Bentley, 11-time Ironman champion, 2006, third in Kona, and one of our favorite people on the planet. <laughs> How you doing, Lisa? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. You want to get that guy a little closer because we right. got a lot of background noise. Okay, so, sounds good. Lisa, you are running Boston. Is this, have you done this one before? I've done it three times before. Yes. Uh, never when I was a professional triathlete, though. It was right. always a retirement thing for right. me. And uh, so I had an opportunity to race this year. So I thought, uh, let's give it a go. I love it. What is it about this course that you like? It's the city. It <laughs> it's is, it's right? the city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I love this town. I love the people. I love the energy of the town. I love the course. I like the downhill. There's no question about that. I like the heart, the difficulty of Heartbreak Hill. I love the finish line. But, you know, I just really think I love being in Boston and being surrounded by like-minded people. It's, it's a privilege and an honor to get to race here. Now, are you here with a group by yourself? Who are you, who are you hanging with? I am here with my husband, Dave, and we always make it a great weekend. Years ago, the first time I came, I came with a sponsor just to watch the event. And I thought, oh, I want to do that one day. And then when I retired from professional triathlon, I had the opportunity to, to do my first one in 2011. And it hurt way more than any Ironman <laughs> ever hurt. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How fast did you go? Well, my first year, I wasn't really well trained. I think I, I ran under three hours, but not super fast. Uh, probably, I think I ran 258, which was my Ironman marathon time, actually. Yes. Uh, then I run my fastest one was 247 here in 2014. Wow. Uh, that hurt a lot as well. There's something that happens at mile 20. It's just different, right? <laughs> it's just different. And I said to my husband, well, it's like my toes get braided up <laughs> and, I, and my calves start <laughs> twingling and it gets so hard. But uh it's, it's worth it in a sense, like to be here. Uh, I don't think I'd be able to come to Boston without right. doing this run. <laughs> so 20 years old, you get diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And at that point, were you a professional triathlete already or just moving into it? What, where were you at at that stage of your life? I was at university and I was just starting to do triathlon. Uh -huh. So I was an age group athlete, and but I was 20 and I was indestructible. So of it was course. like, oh yeah, whatever. And I didn't really think much about it. So I just had to go on antibiotics more often. And, uh, but I was relatively healthy. And like I said, you know, 20 years old, you can do anything. So it didn't change my life at all. And so moved into the professional ranks, raced as a pro for a lot of years, won 11 titles. When you look at your career, and uh, you know, you've you know, two New Zealand, five Australia, five, uh, three Canada, do you have a favorite when you look back at your big... And sometimes people will say, it's not so much the wins, it was this race that meant the most to me. What, what race meant the most to you? Kona was always the difficult one. It was the one that escaped me. This, the nutrition plan that one Ironman Australia for me didn't work in Hawaii. Uh, there was always something come up in Hawaii. That was the difficult one. So that's probably the one. Uh, when it goes smoothly, it uh, it doesn't seem to mean as much. It always does. Don't get me wrong. Right. Every every Ironman win was huge. To be able to put yourself in a position to win and then actually win is a huge deal. Uh, I loved Australia. I felt part of that community every time I raced in Australia. Right. I loved Canada because it was home. Hawaii, though, I love the island. I love the heat. I love the warmth. I love the complexity. I love that the best person wins. And it's and what's great about people talk about the heat and the wind, but really what makes Kona Kona is the competition, right? Nobody is going. I'm racing through this. This isn't really my A. Everybody is there frothing at the bit to win that race, and you know that there's. 20 women thinking they're going to be racing for the win in the last 10K. There's no question. And I think that's part of the reason why it is so difficult, even nutritionally. Like my nutrition plan in Australia didn't work in Hawaii for so many reasons. I think the effort in Hawaii is higher. Of course, you've got the heat. But right. I also think there's that anxiety issue. That burns calories. Like you're burning calories while you're thinking about your competition. Somebody's <laughs> making a move. I've got to be ready. You can't just go steady state. You've got to react. That's you're right. racing. And when you react, you burn matches. And you're burning, even if it's 50 more calories. Like you think about if you're off your game by 1%, that's five minutes. That's a victory. That's podium. That's no podium. And so that's what I love about Kona. 
and you know I did have some health issues there a couple of times so I it just I never was able to be at my best right. 2006 even though it was my best year coming in third still wasn't my best I still had those eight minute miles in there and they should never have been in there I should have been able to tick off the seven minute miles that whole thing and it just never it never happened I'd love to have another go at it but only if I was as fit as I was <laughs> in 2006 so when did it get to the point where the cystic fibrosis affected you where you'd go into a race and not know is, is my health gonna be okay or not Every lead up to a race, I was testing for the sore throat, how I would feel. I, there were several Ironmans I had to race while on antibiotics. That was always difficult. Antibiotics yeah. really dull your game anyway, but then the antibiotics I went on actually caused Achilles tendon rupture, which of course led to me ultimately having Achilles surgery. Oh. Uh, and so there's not much, you have to take the medication. Have to take it. And there was actually a year where I said, I don't want to take the medicine all the time. I want to try to fight it. And that was actually the year 2009 when I kept getting sicker and sicker and my lung function went from 100% to 56%. 56% and you're ra it's not like you're going out and running an age group race, you're racing against the best people in the world. And that was a tough year and I mean think about 56%, 50% is one lung. Right. So uh, that was when I ended up retiring for many reasons, I was 40. And there were other things I wanted to do, sure. so it wasn't a terrible time. It was actually fine, uh, but my last race was uh, Subaru Ironman 70.3 Muskoka, and I was coughing up blood in that race. And, and of course, a lot of people would say, why did you race? You weren't well enough, but that's what I always, I look back on it and I say, I say to myself that I, I have cystic fibrosis, it's who I ha am, and I always tell people to embrace your deck of cards. Whatever you that, got to deal with, got. you're dealing with. And that yeah. was what I had to deal with. And so it would be a disservice if I didn't do the best I could with my deck of cards. Right. Now, certainly, I knew I wasn't putting my health in danger. I could modify pace. Hey, I could only go as fast as I could with the lung capacity that I had. Right. Uh, but, you know, I always say you do the best you can with your deck of cards. If it's a bee sting, if it's a sunburn, if it's cramping, you do the best you can. So that's why I did that last race, and I'm glad I did it. And I finished the race, and I did the best I could, and, and you then knew I you could walk away. I walked away and went to the hospital and went on intravenous. <laughs> oh, did you really? <laughs> a few months later, they tried oh, a few. They tried a few other courses of medicine. Yes. Uh, and uh, so my last race was September 2009, and I was uh, admitted to hospital in January 2010, and uh, was on antibiotics for five weeks. So what so, is the lung function now? Uh, I'm probably around 80. To 85 percent, I seem to hover around there. Yeah, uh, I had a collapsed lung last summer, so that kind of took. A I like bit of how it's sort of off. like casual. I had a collapsed lung last summer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it came on pretty quick. A week prior to the diagnosis, my uh, lungs uh, in X-ray were completely clear, and then a week later, I was having trouble breathing and some pain down my arm, and it lasted a couple of days. And I thought I better go get an X-ray, and sure enough, uh, it came back that it was a collapsed lung. So about a week later, they went in and tried to get rid of the the uh, mucus that was yes. blocking it and that was a horrific procedure <laughs> oh my God. but anyway it came out and literally it just reinflates boom and yeah. back to normal so once you retired what did you want to do what were you did you want to get into coaching did you want to get into motivational speaking what was the next path for lisa bentley well i wanted to do everything of, of course, course you did yes <laughs> uh, i love motivational speaking so i'm doing more and more of that uh, I was fortunate I got to speak at the Titan Summit in Switzerland last year, which was extraordinary with Robin wow. Sharma. Uh, so I hope to do more speaking. Uh, I love coaching, so I am coaching. I am doing some uh, representation works for some professional athletes, so I love oh, that. Oh, nice. I, what I, athletes? Uh, I work with Alicia Kay and uh, Brett McMahon, Jared Shoemaker, and Magalie Tissier. So I've got a nice little crowd. You have of a great group. Wow. And, and a few Canadians uh, yeah. in there. So I love I love that because I did my own sponsorship when right. I was an athlete. So for me it's so normal to be looking and saying, Hey, that's a great fit. Right. And I can't get away from that. And I did that uh, with Ironman uh, Corporation for three years as well. Uh, I don't do it anymore, but yes. I did. So I, I actually, I love the representation work. I love the coaching, of course. Right. I love the speaking, and I was supposed to write a book. I, I plotted out that I was going to write a book from January to February. Yes. 
Because it would only take two months, of course. Of course, books are easy. Yeah, it's and not a problem. Yeah. All I've done is the table of contents, <laughs> so I'm a little behind. <laughs> but I desperately want to write a book because I, I have a lot to share. And uh, I mean, really, I just love life, and I yes. love um, I love being busy. And of course, every now and then, it kind of sneaks up on me, and I have a breakdown, and that lasts about an hour, and then I'm okay again. But I, I love life. You also, your era, you had some amazing competitors. Were there a couple of athletes who you battled over and over and over against? Gosh, I mean, of who course, are some of your best battles with? Of course, Heather Fuhrer. I was going to say Bowden, Heather. Yes, uh, other Canadians. Yes, Natasha Badman. Yeah, That's they one. were. There were some battles there, but they weren't battles in the sense of um, animosity. No, anyway. no, they were just people I raced. McKaylee Jones, although she's the cream of the crop, I still say she's just the best triathlete ever. The fact that she could... From sprint to do, Ironman, yeah, she could do it all. Every distance. And now that she's doing races, Para. uh, Paralympics, <laughs> I, I, I salute that. I, I really wish I could do that. Uh, she's she's amazing. But the competitors in my, t my day, I just, I loved them, and yet I loved beating them. Uh, we had the best of both worlds that we, we had friendships. And they're still, they're still there. There's... I saw Lori Bowden after several years of not seeing her, and we just couldn't stop talking. Uh, I'm so you guys could be competitive and still be friends, because really it's you against you on race day. The other person's there, and obviously you want to beat them, but they don't really control your destiny. No. Right? You control your destiny. Absolutely. We, we did have long-term relationships. Uh, there's no question. And wanted the best for each other, and we're happy for each other when the best came to be right so it was it was it was neat i was lucky to race i think when i did you yeah it was a great era uh so on monday what do you you have a specific time or you just like listen i enjoy every second let's uh let's go by wellesley let's go yeah. just enjoy the <laughs> newton hills we enjoy every second of it yeah i mean i i'm not sure what to expect uh as you know i had achilles surgery 2015 yeah. and so of course i'm back running naturally but um you Will know, this be your first marathon since it's yes. the surgery? Ah. First marathon since the surgery. So in that sense, I don't know what to expect. I didn't get in as many long runs as I would have liked. Uh, that's the, probably the missing link you from the do Achilles. You're going to do a long run on Monday. I'm going to do workout. a really a long deal? run on Monday. I, I think um, I, I want to break three hours. Nice. Uh, I'd love to be in around 250, but I have no reason to think I will be 250 because my training has not... Uh, told me I would be in right. the 250s. But I, I also know that when a gun goes off, that there's a very uh, different part of me that comes alive, yes. and it will come alive uh, on race day, and I will draw all the energy from the people on the course, as well as from the athletes I coach. You know, I really coach some wonderful people, and they've wished me so many good blessings, and I will draw their energy because... Um, because it's good, for, it's good for me to feel the pain that the athletes I coach feel. Because exactly. it makes me a better coach. So, and, so, with cystic fibrosis, how has the research changed? How has the treatment changed? Is it better now than it was when you were 20 years old? It's extraordinary. Uh, it's extraordinary. It's so much better. The median age of survival in the 60s was five years old. The median age of survival probably 10 years ago was 32 years old. Wow. And the median survival age now is probably close to 50. And it's uh, it's a miracle. There's two new drugs that are out that can treat different uh, genetic factors uh -huh. involved. None of them treat myself, but uh, there's- But it's coming. There, it's coming. And there's better there's better preventative treatments. And, and that's the wonderful thing, if there can be something wonderful about cystic fibrosis is when I'm coughing up blood, they're not saying, oh my God, what's wrong with you? They know what's wrong, they treat it immediately. It's not like somebody who has something wrong and six months later they find out they have cancer. I, I have a condition and they immediately know what they need to do so they can act on it so yes. I don't get the damage that other people get. While wow, they're trying to hunt and figure out what it is. Exactly, so my lung damage is, is so minimal at this stage. And, That's great. And so I'm so lucky and other people with CF are so lucky. So there's so many preventative things that are out there and uh so yeah it's it's good i'm not i'm not worried as i turn 50 in a couple of years i'm not worried that um that my life's gonna end when my I'm, life's just gonna I'm, keep going i'm sure there was a point when you start looking at those numbers where you're going i better enjoy every minute because i don't know 
Yeah, right? you, you never know. But none of us do. No, you never know. And uh, I know just from the time that I had the lung function go down so drastically that when you don't stay on top of it, that that's the sort of thing that sure. happens. And my doctors don't ever let that happen. As soon as, you know, last year my lung function dropped to about 70%, they were immediately talking about intravenous. They weren't going to let it get down to 50. And when I had the collapsed lung, they they weren't going to let it sit there. They said, you're healthy enough, we can do this procedure, it'll be hard on you, but we're going to do it. And so I went in and had the procedure done. So they, you know, they don't wait around and say, oh, let's see if you can cough it out. No way. They gave me a couple of days to cough it out. It didn't work. I was in the hospital getting it taken care of. Love it. <laughs> hey, Lise, thank you. What I love is the fact that you've always, you've never hidden, right? You're dealing with something. And it's important for people to know that a world-class athlete for somebody sitting at home who's struggling with cystic fibrosis to know that you were at the top of the totem pole, that you won 11 titles, dealing with that disease, that goes so far for people getting through just their day-to-day, -day, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about overcoming adversity right. and being the best you can be with your deck of cards and just saying, hey, you know, like, it, it's it just be you. Right. Be you. Don't try to be somebody else. Be the best you can be take care of yourself it doesn't mean walk around and get sick and, right. and woe is me you just got to like do what you can so you know on sun on monday if my lung function 75 percent, i'm going to run the best that i can and that might be 302 and if my lung function is 100 percent, then maybe i'm going to run 240 you know like i don't know <laughs> but um you know i'm going to use every breath that i have i love it lisa bentley has been our guest thanks lisa always always a pleasure all right, again, this is Postcards from the Finish Line, and we are brought to you by Highlands. Stop your cramp, not your race. Also brought to you by Polar. Chase your destiny. Hold on, everybody. We will be right back.